Thank you for being here as we reinvent what we normally do. Tonight's topic is opera and politics. I'm assuming most of you groaned when you saw that title and I don't blame you one bit, but I make a few promises. One, I'm not going to touch current politics. For that, there is everything else available online. Two, I'll drop in some sufficiently obscure facts. And three, we're gonna have random cute pet photos for no reason other than that we all need to smile a bit right now. As with last month, when I'm done with my presentation, we'll go to your questions, which can be on anything, not necessarily the topic of this talk. I have uh, some questions that were sent in before this, but if you are watching live on October 8th, you can also type your questions into the YouTube conversation box. If you're watching this not live, feel free to email questions to info at madisonopera.org. I'd love to chat. And like all good Zoom calls, we now go to the sharing my screen bit. So what do I mean by politics and opera? Fundamentally, I mean that operas and the opera world do not exist separate from the time in which they are written or performed. Just because someone is singing about love, death, and how much they want to kill the baritone doesn't mean the outside world doesn't have an impact on what went on stage. Likewise, how a performance is received by the audience is affected by their own daily reality. Let's remember too that some politicians, which since we're talking about opera really means the nobility, actually like opera. The history of European opera is one of patronage, i.e. it was paid for by royalty. In the 1700s, one of the opera companies in London was literally, literally called the opera of the nobility. Emperor Joseph II was a famous supporter of the arts, including Mozart and Salieri. King Ludwig II of Bavaria was a major sponsor of Wagner. And the fact he was called Mad King Ludwig may say something about anyone who would pay for the ring cycle. On the American side, the Kennedy White House once hosted a performance of Mozart's The Magic Flute as part of a state dinner for the president of India. Noble rulers sometimes change jobs just like modern politicians do. Early in his career, Handel was head of music for Prince George of Hanover. Four years later, Prince George became King George I of England which was fortunate for Handel, who was then, then living in England and so had an in with his new employer. Staying on Handel for a moment, remember that not all nobility got along, and again, this can impact opera. By the 1730s, Handel was the acknowledged head of Italian opera in England with strong support from the king. A group of nobles headed by the Prince of Wales wanted to undermine Handel's position. So they literally formed the opera of the nobility to compete with Handel's opera company. Sometimes changes in rulers had financial impacts. For example, when Charles X of France fled into exile in 1830, the new citizen king nullified all kinds of government contracts. One, is the, one of them was for Rossini's pension. Royal patronage could be challenging and not all composers were great at it. Beethoven once threw a chair at a patron and wrote to another, what you are, you are by accident of birth. What I am, I am by myself. There are and will be a thousand princes. There is only one Beethoven. Now we need one of these. Wear a mask. Now into some operas. As I often do, we'll start with Mozart. On a certain level, his works and he himself were never explicitly political. They were designed to be hits and make money, which some did more successfully than others. But The Marriage of Figaro, based on a play, was incendiary to set. So for those of us who have not been in high school for a while, here is a refresher on the general dates of the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille in 1789, the French monarchy is deposed in 1792, and Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette are executed in 1793. So every royal family in Europe is pretty nervous during this time period. Pierre Beaumarchais' play is a comedy ostensibly about the wedding of two servants in a noble household but it was nonetheless full of jabs at the nobility with Figaro denouncing the very idea of hereditary privilege in a famous speech in act five. 
Beaumarchais wrote the play in 1778, but at a private reading for the French court, King Louis XVI was so shocked that he banned it. Beaumarchais revised it and moved the locale to Spain, but it was still not performed until 1784. Napoleon later called the play, The Revolution Already Put Into Action. It had been banned from performance in Vienna when Mozart and librettist Lorenzo de Ponte chose to set it. And by today's light, the opera does not seem political, partly because the music gives everyone their humanity and partly because we don't live in that world. But again, it's the eve of the French Revolution and the lead characters are two servants who are literally successfully scheming against their noble employers and making the point that class does not define intelligence or human rights. Figaro even has an aria, Sevo Ballare, in which he tells the offstage Count Almaviva that he'll make him dance to his tune. In 2020, it's a lovely aria. In 1786, it was political. Mozart's next aria, opera, which premiered in Prague, was Don Giovanni. On the surface, it's about a nobleman who sleeps with a lot of women, kills a man, drinks a lot, and gets dragged to hell by a ghost. That's the legend of Don Juan, and Mozart did not invent it. What he did add was in the act one finale, when the entire cast sings the phrase, Viva la Libertà, long live freedom, 10 times. Again, modern eyes, part of a scene at a party, but those are dangerous words for the year 1787. Another cute photo. Our next composer is an interesting case when it comes to politics. His name literally became a political slogan. He was elected to political office. One of his choruses almost became the Italian national anthem, and yet most of his operas have politics thrust upon them rather than in the writing. I'm talking, of course, about Giuseppe Verdi. One of the greatest opera composers of all time, he wrote 25 operas, the majority of which remain in the repertoire, which is unusual. Born in 1813, he didn't become political until later in life, after he'd achieved fame and fortune writing opera. Fame, fortune, and opera are not usually words you hear at the same time. Like Mozart, some of his operas show the immorality of nobility. For example, Rigoletto, which premiered in 1851. Based on a Victor Hugo play about a jester whose daughter is seduced by his royal employer, it swiftly became famous for its tenor aria, La Donna e Mobile. But the tenor, the Duke of Mantua, is not the good guy, and Rigoletto denounces the entire Mantua court in an act two outburst. Of course, since it's a Verdi opera, it's the soprano who dies, not either of the men, but you know. It's telling that the censors gave Verdi problems with the piece because they knew it was a terrible depiction of the ruling class. So an explanation, censorship was a very real issue for composers in the 19th century in particular. Opera libretti had to be submitted in advance to a city's censors who had the right to demand changes in the setting, the plot, and even the lyrics. The censors were most concerned about plot elements that might incite people politically rather than anything sexual. Things were different with opera censorship in the US. In 1912, the mayor of Boston demanded that act two of Tosca be changed, specifically the part where Scarpia tries to rape Tosca before she then murders him from the newspaper. The mayor sent word to the opera management that unless the performance was modified, he would see that the license was recalled, saying the management must see to it that those performing maintain a proper standing of propriety. The Tosca, Mary Garden, declares she will change nothing in the show, mayor or no mayor, and that she will not allow her artistic ideals to be interfered with in Boston. Back to Verdi. His most explicitly political opera was A Masked Ball, written in 1859. It was even more dangerous than Rigoletto, as it told of the assassination of King Gustav of Sweden, which was a real thing that happened in 1792, but since it's an opera, Verdi's version has the cause of death basically being a love triangle. The very act of a royal assassination was condemned by the censors, who didn't want anyone in the audience to get ideas. Their initial demands to Verdi were, the king must become a duke, the action must be transferred to a pre-Christian age, the conspirators must not want to take power, and no firearms allowed. Verdi made these changes, moving the opera to northern Germany. Unfortunately, five days before rehearsals were to begin, there was an attempted assassination of Emperor Napoleon III in, person, in Paris, which sort of put a new twist on the whole assassination plot point. 
So the censor ruled that the entire text of Masked Ball would have to be rewritten, including changing King Gustav into a gentleman, i.e. not a ruler, and having the assassination take place off stage. Eventually, Verdi agreed to set the opera in colonial Boston, which was sufficiently exotic and removed from modern day Europe. After Masked Ball, Verdi was fed up with arguing with censors. So he took a break from composing, which is when he became involved in politics. In 1858, Italian nationalists started using the slogan Viva Verdi, which was an acronym for Viva Vittorio Emmanuel, Re d'Italia, or Long Live Vittorio Emmanuel, the King of Italy. Verdi was elected to the new provincial council, then a few years later to parliament, and then eventually was appointed to the Senate, although he seldom attended meetings. But it was an early hit of Verdi's that has the biggest political resonance now. Nabucco premiered when Verdi was 29. A biblical opera, it tells of Nabucco, the king of Babylon, as he destroys the Israeli temple, declares himself to be a god, goes mad, is overthrown by Wanda Otter, signs a death warrant for his other daughter, and eventually magically recovers from his madness. I maintain that it has the most ridiculous plot ever, not to mention some almost obnoxiously hard music for the soprano, but it was Ver Verdi's first big hit. And in the middle of act three is Va Pensiero, also called the chorus of the Hebrew slaves. In it, the captured Israelites mourn the loss of their homeland and its beauty went on to a life far beyond the opera. The crowd broke into it during Verdi's 1901 funeral procession. In 1981, there was a proposal to make it Italy's national anthem. In 2011, conductor Riccardo Muti led the audience of the Rome opera in a sing-along mid-performance after he'd made a speech protesting Italy's arts budget cuts. It's also, less politically, the chorus that we have performed most often at Opera in the Park. So, speaking of political composers, you might expect me to talk about Richard Wagner, who wasn't shy about expressing his views as problematic as some of them were. But his work was not directly political. I mean, apart from the end of Meistersinger, where if you hear it today with a literal translation, you will become very uncomfortable with language that will sound familiar from the Nazi era. But Wagner wrote about Nordic mythology and medieval knights, not about current rulers. And then to be clear, I'm talking about the way, I'm not talking about the way people have chosen to interpret Wagner or that the way productions after his lifetime have set them in particular political periods. I'm just talking about the operas as he wrote them. And I know this photo already has one pet in it, but have another. So I assume you weren't expecting me to mention comic political operas, because truthfully, it's hard to be funny when talking about politics. As playwright George S. Kaufman once said, satire is what closes on Saturday night. But Jacques Offenbach got away with it. His operators were full of light political satire, and he was massively popular in his adopted Paris. Napoleon III gave him the Légion d'honneur. Napoleon's half-brother even wrote a libretto for Offenbach called Mr. Cauliflower Will Be Home On. It spoofed Italian opera singers. And the first performance was given at the Bourbon Palace before it was given for the public. Offenbach's biggest hit, though, was the Grand Duchesse of Gerolstein, a satire on militarism, it includes one side winning a battle by getting the other side drunk, and it opened two days after the new Paris Exposition, meaning many foreign military visitors saw it. When Otto von Bismarck, the Prime Minister of Prussia, was asked what he thought about the piece, which he had seen, he said, that's exactly how it is. Of course, Prussia and France were at war two years later, so who knows. So. Speaking of the Franco-Prussian War, it broke out in summer 1870 and the Prussian army had surrounded Paris by the fall. French theaters were repurposed as hospitals and the Paris opera was turned into an arsenal. Charles Gounod, composer of Faust, fled to England. And although he was French, he wrote to the Crown Prince of Prussia who had just invaded France, declaring his loyalty to German art and asking him to protect the Gounod family home. The Crown Prince actually did have his troops seal up the home, protecting it from both sides. In contrast, Georges Bizet stayed in Paris and joined the National Guard. During training, he wrote of their antiquated equipment, saying the guards were more dangerous to the soldiers than the enemy. 
An armistice was signed in January 1871, but the departure of the Prussian troops was followed by a period of civil disturbance known as the Paris Commune. Lizay continued to serve in the National Guard, but eventually fled to rural France. That spring, he wrote to his mother-in-law, I rarely laugh anymore, I confess, and the future seems to me impossible in France. Music will have no future here. He spoke of emigrating to Italy, England, or America. He wrote, society, however democratic it may be, can only be founded on absolute respect for human life, for liberty, and for property. For context, Bizet's opera Carmen premiered four years after he had declared that he could see no future for music in France. So now we go to Russia and the Soviet Union. So a quick refresher on their history. The Romanovs came to power in 1613. The February Revolution of 1917 brought an end to that. Lenin was the head of the government from 1917 until his death in 1924. And then Stalin was in power from then until his death in 1953. And we definitely need one of these. So we'll start a half century before the Russian Revolution with Boris Godunov by Modest Mussorgsky. Set in the late 1500s, it's about the title character who killed the heir to the Russian throne so that he could become a czar himself. Over the course of the opera, a monk pretends to be the lost heir to the throne. Boris starts seeing visions of the child he killed. Hungry citizens beg for bread. And then Boris goes mad and dies. It's based on a play by Alexander Pushkin that was published in 1831, but was not approved for performance by the censors until decades after Pushkin's death. Mussorgsky finished his opera in 1869, but the Imperial Theater rejected it because there was no female lead. Meanwhile, Pushkin's play, with 25% of the scenes cut per order of the censors, finally premiered in 1870. Mussorgsky started rewriting his opera. One challenge was that it was literally illegal to portray a czar in an opera. That law was amended in 1872 to protect only Romanov czars, meaning that Boris Godunov was now fair game. So the opera premiered in 1874 and was a massive success with the public. The imperial family was less fond of it. One grand duke called it a shame to all Russia and not an opera. At the same time he was writing Boris, Mussorgsky was writing another political opera, Kovanchina. Set during the time of Peter the Great, it involves political and religious factions fighting and ends with the old believers setting themselves on fire, which is a nifty trick to pull up on stage, believe me. Mussorgsky died in 1881 before finishing Kovanchina. His friend and former roommate, Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov, completed the work and submitted it to the Imperial Theater. They rejected it, saying, one radical opera by Mussorgsky is enough. It did ultimately premiere in 1886. As for Boris Godunov, it was performed only 21 times during Mussorgsky's life and only five times the year he died. A Russian critic at the time wrote, when the list of operas for the winter was presented to His Majesty the Emperor, he was pleased to strike out Boris with a wavy line in blue pencil. It wasn't performed again for another 23 years. So, so the Metropolitan Opera did Kovanchina when I worked there and I liked it very much. And at the same time as it's run, I went to see a concert staging of Rogers and Hart's Babes in Arms. Written during the Great Depression, Babes in Arms is a cheerful musical with plenty of dancing and the basic premise that anything can be solved if we just put on a show in the big red barn. And it struck me as very something that American artwork produced during a terrible historical moment was let's put on a show kids. And the Russian equivalent was let's burn everyone alive. So happy Halloween, by the way. So staying in Russia, now the Soviet Union, let's go to Lady Macbeth of Metsensk by Dmitry Shostakovich. Based on an 1865 novella, it tells of a woman who has an affair with one of her husband's workers, then murders her father-in-law, and then her lover kills her husband, and things get worse from there. It is honestly fairly grisly and sexually violent throughout. It premiered in 1934 in Leningrad, which of course used to be St. Petersburg, and was a success both with the public and Soviet officials. Over the next two years, it was performed several hundred times nationwide and around the world. Party officials called Shostakovich a Soviet composer brought up in the best tradition of Soviet culture. 
Two years later, an unsigned article appeared in Pravda titled Muddle Instead of Music. Ominously, a couple of days earlier, Stalin had attended a Lady Macbeth performance and left mid-opera. The Pravda article now called Lady Macbeth coarse, primitive, and vulgar, saying that Shostakovich's music lacked simple and popular musical language accessible to all. It further said that Shostakovich ignored the demands of Soviet culture. Never mind what newspaper music critics say, this is an actual bad review. Shostakovich lost most of his income and commissions, and most of his colleagues disassociated themselves from him. He was forced to cancel the premiere of his fourth symphony and was not rehabilitated until two years later. Lady Macbeth itself was banned in the Soviet Union for almost 30 years until 1961, several years after Stalin died. So now let's go to Italy and the complications for musicians there in the early 20th century. Again, some dates. Italy claimed neutrality at the start of World War I while secretly negotiating with both Germany and the Allies, eventually joining the war on behalf of the latter. Mussolini founded the Italian Fascist Party in 1919 and became prime minister slash dictator in a 1922 coup. He was deposed in 1943 and executed in 1945. So we'll start here with Arturo Toscanini. Born in 1867, he was the most acclaimed international conductor of the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th. He played cello in the world premiere of Verdi's Otello when he was only 20 years old and conducted the world premieres of La Boheme, Turandot, Pagliacci, and many more operas. At varying periods, he was music director of the Metropolitan Opera, La Scala in Milan, the New York Philharmonic, and the NBC Symphony Orchestra, the latter of which made him a household name in the US due to their many broadcasts. In the early months of World War I, Puccini told Toscanini that he thought Italy could benefit from German organization. So Toscanini broke off their longstanding friendship. During the fight, Puccini forgot to strike Toscanini off the list of people to whom he sent a Christmas panettone. He wired to Toscanini, panettone sent by mistake, Puccini. Toscanini wired back, panettone eaten by mistake, Toscanini. Mussolini called Toscanini the greatest conductor in the world. And in 1919, Toscanini ran as a fascist parliamentary candidate in 19 Milan. But he became disillusioned with fascism quickly and repeatedly defied Mussolini. He refused to display Mussolini's photograph or conduct the fascist anthem at La Scala, storming out of a performance in 1922 when the audience cried out for it during an act of Falstaff. He once said to a friend, if I were capable of killing a man, I would kill Mussolini. In May 1931, a group of fascist police beat up the 67-year-old Toscanini outside the Bologna Opera House as he still refused to conduct the fascist anthem. Mussolini allegedly said that he was really happy about that, adding, it will teach a good lesson to these boorish musicians. Mussolini had Toscanini's phones tapped, placed him under surveillance, and confiscated his passport. Toscanini left Italy at the outbreak of World War II, not returning until 1946, when he conducted the reopening of La Scala. In contrast, Pietro Mascani, composer of Cavalleria Rusticana, joined the fascist party, becoming an adherent of Mussolini, even having his own fascist uniform. So I should add, Scani's in his 60s during this time period, about four years older than Toscanini. When Mascani's final opera, Neroni, premiered in 1935, Mussolini called backstage after every act to ask how it was going. Now, Cavalleria Rusticana is often paired in performance with Ruggiero Leoncavallo's Pagliacci, and Leoncavallo had different political problems. Although Italian, he was a beloved composer in Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm was a patron and hired him to write a nationalist German opera, choosing the subject and helping write the libretto. After it premiered in 1904, the Kaiser gave Leoncavallo the Order of the Crown. So when World War I broke out a decade later, Leoncavallo found himself in a tricky position because Italy was at war with Germany. He tried to situate himself as an artist of the world, not any one particular country, but German opera houses canceled performances of his works because of his ingratitude and hostile feelings towards Germany. So speaking of Germany, let's go there. Always a favorite thing to discuss in the 20th century. 
take a good look at this creature. So for their historical markers, you have Kaiser Wilhelm II, who reigned from 1888 until he was forced to abdicate in 1918. Then comes the Weimar Republic, which lasts until 1933, when Adolf Hitler becomes chancellor. Hitler invades Poland in September 1939 and the Soviet Union in June 1941. The Allies defeat Germany in May 1945. So we're going to need lots of cute pet photos to go through this. And we'll start with Kurt Weill's The Three Penny Opera with a libretto by Bertolt Brecht. It's based on The Beggar's Opera, an 18th century ballad opera by John Gay. Set in the London underworld, The Beggar's Opera was a satire on Italian opera with a baritone lead who marries the daughter of a criminal organizer, then turns out to have slept with many women, four of whom are pregnant. It ends happily because the narrator says that's what audiences want. In Kurt Weill and Brecht's telling, the opera is a dark satire on capitalism set in the late 19th century. It also has great music, like the song we now call Mac the Knife. So going back in time for a moment, The Beggar's Opera premiered in 1728 in London and was a massive hit. Three months later, Handel's newest opera, Ptolemeo, premiered and was a comparative flop. The contrast of the popular hit versus the versus the cost of grand opera caused Handel's opera company to declare bankruptcy. And thus the first of many times in the centuries that people have declared that opera as an art form is dying. So Kurt Weill's Three Penny Opera premiered 200 years later and was a success. Although Weill intended it for the masses, its Berlin performances were intended by the wealthy. By the time Weill and Brecht fled Nazi Germany in 1933, the opera had been translated into 18 languages and performed more than 10,000 times in Europe. Berlin's first theater performance after World War II was a rough production of Three Penny at the same theater where it had premiered. One writer described how audience members climbed over ruins and passed through a tunnel to reach the auditorium, which no longer had a ceiling. In addition to the smell of dead bodies trapped beneath the rubble, the writer recollects the actors themselves were haggard, starved, and in genuine rags. Many of the actors had only just been released from a concentration camp. They sang not well, but free. As I said, we're going to need some of these. The Nazi concentration camps included one model camp, Theresienstadt, where music was allowed. Out of it came Der Kaiser von Atlantis, The Emperor of Atlantis or the Disobedience of Death, a one-act opera by Victor Ullman with a libretto by Peter Keen. A non-realistic drama, it's about an emperor who declares universal war with everyone ordered to fight until there are no survivors. Death, who is a character, goes on strike in anger that the emperor has usurped his role. Confusion results, a male soldier and a female soldier sing a love duet instead of fighting each other, and sick people can no longer die. Death offers to return if the emperor will be the first to die and the emperor accepts. Ullman and Keen wrote the opera around 1943. It was even rehearsed at Terezin in March 1944. But obviously the emperor is a stand-in for Hitler, so it's not surprising the Nazis would not allow it to be performed. Ullman gave his manuscript to a fellow prisoner who survived the camps. Both composer and librettist were killed in Auschwitz and the opera premiered in Amsterdam in 1975. German composer Richard Strauss is not someone we think of as a political composer, at least in terms of operas like Der Rosenkavalier, Elektra, Salome, and Ariadne of Naxos. But look at his dates. He was a composer in the midst of politics. He was principal conductor of the Vienna State Opera until 1924, co-founded the Salzburg Festival, and became the head of Bayreuth in 1933 after Toscanini had resigned in protest of the Nazis. Strauss was also appointed president of the Nazis newly founded Reichmusikkammer, but without asking to be. And I'm not going to go in depth here, but Strauss never joined the Nazi party. He worked to preserve the music of banned Jewish composers like Mahler and Mendelssohn, and mostly he tried to protect his Jewish daughter-in-law and his grandchildren, although he could not protect all of their relatives. For his 1935 opera, The Silent Woman, Strauss worked with Jewish librettist Stefan Zweig, an Austrian citizen, Zweig's libretto had to be approved by the authorities. It was, and Hitler said he would attend the Dresden premiere. A few days before the performance, Strauss found that Zweig's name had been eliminated from the playbill. Strauss wrote in the name, 
Hitler missed the premiere, the opera was banned after three performances, and Strauss was dismissed from his government job. And if you're curious, the opera itself is based on a Ben Jonson comedy about an old man in 1700s London who wants to marry a silent young woman, and then his nephew's opera trip gets involved, sort of very Don Pasquale-like. It's, it's non-political an opera, as you could imagine. Three years later was the premiere of Friedenstag, Peace Day, a one-act opera set in a fortress on the last day of the Thirty Years' War in 1648. Although Stefan Zweig had come up with the idea, he suggested that Strauss work with a non-Jewish librettist for the actual writing so that he wouldn't get banned. Zweig had fled to England and would eventually emigrate to Brazil. Essentially a thinly veiled criticism of the Nazis, Friedenstag ends with a hymn to peace and was only performed for a year before disappearing. Pet break. Over in the US, World War II lent meaning to an otherwise fluffy comedy. When Lily Pons sang the title role in Donizetti's The Daughter of the Regiment in the early 1940s, something about the combination of this piece with the hit aria Salut à la France, sung in the US by a French soprano at the time her country was under Nazi occupation, well, it worked. From the New York Times, November 1942. The shadow of our participation in another world conflict dominated a first night at the Metropolitan Opera House. The emphasis was not only on the spirit of the United States under arms, but also the hope for the future in the aspirations of the United Nations. The opera itself came to an end as the composer intended, but then a member of the company strode out carrying the cross of Lorraine, the flag of the fighting French. As he handed it to Miss Pons, the orchestra struck up the Marseillaise. Miss Pons led the entire company in the singing of the French anthem. Then the stars and stripes were carried forward. The conductor gave another single call, and this time the orchestra began the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, World War II is over. Let's go to England. In the, 18, in the 1830s, Donizetti had written three operas about Tudor queens. Roberto Devereux, Anna Bolena, and Maria Stuarda, as those were politically safe for an Italian composer. Now Benjamin Britten had a turn with Gloriana. About Queen Elizabeth I, it premiered in 1953 as part of the celebrations for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Based on a book, it's not the most flattering portrait of Elizabeth I, as it presents the queen late in her life, motivated largely by vanity, rather than showing the brilliant leader she was. The opera was a flop. One review dubbed it Boreana. And having seen it, I kind of have to say I agree. Okay, so now let's come to America and not for Verdi's masked ball. American operas have often told of historical political figures, including presidents. And this was, you know, before Hamilton made us assume that all political figures know how to sing. The Ballad of Baby Doe by Douglas Moore premiered in Colorado in 1956. Set mostly in Colorado, it tells of a real woman named Baby Doe, who takes up with the married horse Tabor, who divorces his wife for her, a scandal in the 19th century. Tabor stakes everything on silver mines and then loses it all. Spanning the last two decades of the 19th century, it's a brilliant piece, and I would call it one of the great American operas. Since Horace Tabor was a real person, who was appointed to political office. The opera has both a president and a famous candidate in it. At the end of act one, President Chester Arthur appears in a small role. And in act two, William Jennings Bryant gives a stump speech that is basically the cross of gold speech that he gave in real life to secure the 1896 Democratic presidential nomination. Bryant losing the presidential election to William McKinley is in fact the major plot turn of act two setting in place Horace Tabor's downfall. We have two operas that are literally about presidents, starting with Nixon in China. Written by John Adams, it premiered in 1987 and is about Nixon's visit to China in 1972, which for time reference was only 15 years earlier when this opera was written. The equivalent now would be an opera about Hurricane Katrina. JFK by David T. Little premiered in Fort Worth in 2016. It's set sort of on the final night of Kennedy's life, which he spent in a hotel in Fort Worth prior to his assassination. It's not a linear story though, and Lyndon B. Johnson even appears in a dream sequence complete with cheerleaders. 
I promise we won't dwell on modern politics, so I'm going to leave the US behind, but I'll just point out that new works continue to have political messages, whether that is the Central Park Five, which won a Pulitzer Prize this year, or Dead Man Walking, which reflects on the death penalty. Pet break. Okay, so I lied. I'm going to touch the modern era again briefly because we just lost the greatest opera lover in our government, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Leaving aside all her enormous professional accomplishments, she was a massive opera lover, knowledgeable about every aspect of it from Handel's operas to the present day. She appeared as a supernumerary with Washington National Opera several times, even in a speaking role in The Daughter of the Regiment. Her colleague on the Supreme Court, Antonin Scalia, was also an opera lover, and the two went to the opera together, appeared as supers in the opera together, and even had an opera written about them. Scalia Ginsburg by Derek Wing was written when both justices were alive and was first heard at the Supreme Court before being performed in public. A three-person opera, the text is taken from constitutional theory and the justices' own judicial writings. My final segment goes back in time to an opera that to some extent ties these various themes of opera and politics together. It had a royal patron, issues with the censor, external political events affecting opening night, and it resonates centuries later. I'm talking about Beethoven's Fidelio. Telling of a noble woman who disguises herself as a man and gets a job in a prison in order to rescue her husband, a political prisoner, is not the most specific of plots. We never know anything about the politics or who did what to whom. The bad guy is very bad, the tenor is unjustly imprisoned, and goodness prevails. It was based on a French play, which had already been made into several operas, so Beethoven didn't invent the plot, but his music added power. It has two great choruses. The one at the end proclaims justice for all. More famous is the prisoner's chorus in act one, when the prisoners emerge into the light for a few moments of fresh air and sing longingly of freedom. Two weeks before the November 1805 premiere in Vienna, the censors banned the libretto. Beethoven's librettist appealed to a friend in politics saying, I wrote this letter because Her Majesty the Empress repeatedly told me that no opera subject had ever interested her as much. I now request you to do what you can. You will eternally oblige Her Majesty the Empress who particularly loves this piece. So the censors allowed the opera to proceed, but one week later, one week before the premiere, Napoleon invaded Vienna and everyone fled the city. So on opening night of Fidelio, the theater was basically empty, apart from the occupying French army. It received only two more performances. Beethoven's patrons persuaded him to rewrite it. It premiered again in 1806, unsuccessfully. In 1814, Beethoven went back and really reworked it, and this final version was the success we do today. Fidelio's themes of freedom and the triumph of justice over tyranny made it an obvious candidate to be performed on occasions of political significance in the centuries that followed. It was one of the last operas performed in Salzburg before the Nazis entered the city. Under Nazi rule, opera companies continued to perform Fidelio. One writer referred to such performances as an obscenity. During World War II, the Metropolitan Opera continued to perform the opera, but they sang it in English, not German. And in December 1944, it was the first full-length opera that Toscanini conducted over the NBC radio network. It was the first opera performed in Berlin after the end of World War II, with the Deutsche Oper staging it at Berlin's only undamaged theater. More than one writer noted the irony of this choice. The Vienna State Opera House was destroyed in the war, but the company produced Fidelio in 1945 at the theater where Beethoven's first version had premiered. A decade later, the Vienna State Opera House reopened with Fidelio in a live television broadcast that was also played through loudspeakers to the crowd gathered outside the theater. Fast forward three decades. To celebrate the 40th anniversary of East Germany, the Dresden Opera opened a new production of Fidelio in October 1989 at a time of violent demonstrations in the city. The production was set in modern dress, making the parallels obvious, and the applause after the prisoners' chorus stopped the show. Four weeks later, the Berlin Wall fell. In 2004, the 10th anniversary of the end of apartheid in South Africa was marked with a performance of Fidelio in the courtyard of the prison at Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela had been imprisoned. Mandela was in the audience. 
No other opera carries as much political weight as Fidelio. Perhaps because its plot points actually are generic, it is truly universal in its emotions, and the longing for freedom resonates constantly. So I have to share this. For those who don't know, it's an early Peanuts cartoon, and Schroeder is very fond of Beethoven. So now we get to my brilliant closer. That's literally what I first typed on the bizarre theory that I would come up with one. And of course, I don't have one because this is not six years of dissertation work. But if you take anything away from tonight other than cute pet photos and the fact that the nobility seem to like to write opera librettos, opera has existed in many difficult years and the great ones and the great voices are still with us. When we're done tonight, go listen to some Beethoven, some Mozart, some Jake Heggie, some Anthony Davis, even some Shostakovich, although maybe you don't wanna to listen to Lady Macbeth Matense tonight. The music lasts and it's still here for us. Okay, time for questions. If you're watching this live, please type your questions into the YouTube conversation box so I can see them. And if you're watching this after October 8th, feel free to email me at info at madisonopera.org. And you now have to forgive the glare on my glasses as I read my computer screen. But before we go to questions, just a reminder that the December Opera Novice is basically subscriber's choice. If you have suggestions for a topic you've always wanted me to talk about, great opera scandals, the life of a particular singer, a particular opera, a particular composer, please email them to info at madisonopera.org and I will pick something later this month to present in December. So I will start with a question that was set in advance by Matt Ripley. Um, he says, there are a lot of operas that draw the ire of, ire of censors for their stories or settings, but have there been any examples of operas getting censored for things like the music itself or the libretto? Honestly, there's very little censorship of the music until we get to the Soviet area. I'll stop there because what was being submitted was always the libretto. I don't know of any time that Verdi had to submit his music to a censor. Um, and to me, that's it's not, I want to say silly, but that sort of ignores the point. I mean, the reason Fidelio has power is the music, because music is fundamentally manipulative. And I once saw a production of Prokofiev's War and Peace, um, which ends with the triumph of the French on the battlefield. And it makes you, sorry, triumph of the Russians. And it makes you want to go fight for Mother Russia just because the music has you so stirred up. So the second part of this question was, are there examples of operas that really took off based on the fact that they were taboo and that they were forbidden, forbidden fruit? Honestly, anything involving sex. So Tosca, Carmen, Salome, La Traviata, pieces that were taboo were taboo for sexual reasons and there is no better way to sell a ticket than that. So I mentioned Jacques Offenbach briefly. Um, and he was called in the New York press, a purveyor of bold, bald indecency, and his works were called moral filth, which is why there were five companies in New York City performing his works at the same time. So, okay, moving on to next, new questions. Sorry. In the way that often politicians hijack modern artist songs for their campaigns, did rulers or politicians ever try to get composers to write operas as propaganda? Definitely that's the entire history of the Soviet Union. I mean, I'm, I can't claim that I know enough now to have said what it is, but that is definitely was a policy of the Soviet Union was to want opera that told political messages, um, which is why if you, how shall I put this? I've heard a number of operas written in the Soviet era and they're not all what we, works we do now. As to the other things, to other rulers, it's sort of self, I don't wanna say self-censorship to some degree, but people with patrons were writing to make their patrons happy. And so if, for example, Kaiser Wilhelm wanted Leon Cavaglio to write this particular opera, he did. So I hope that answers that. Hi, Mike. It's Mike Cato. So if you were the composer, <laughs> Mike, I should have read this before I'm um, putting it up. Um, 
Well, in Offenbach's Orpheus in the Underworld, the fly is a baritone. I will just say that. So there is artistic precedent for that. Um, what by curious, Mike, if you want to write in what you would cast, but let's just go with, we'll use Offenbach's model and have the fly be um, a baritone or Jupiter in disguise really is what he is. Hi, Lynn. So what political opera that you have not produced would you like to produce in Madison? Oh, well, what's funny, the mass ball, Weston Hurt, who many of you know, he was our Germain in La Traviata. He was supposed to sing Trovatore. He has just put together some recordings for all of you, for our digital subscribers um, that we'll be getting out to. And one of them is from Mast Ball. And it just made me remember how much I love that opera. Um, oh, dear, dear, dear. I mean, I love the Russian ones, obviously, like Boris Godunov would be fun to have a shot at. We can't afford it. But like if money were no object, Boris Godunov would have be fun to have a shot at. We've done most of the Mozart. Um, yeah, and again, some of the Russians, I would say, would be fun to do. Again, if money were not an issue, which it is. So, um, so that appears to be all the questions so far. Are there any others? Um, we're doing this weird thing where there's a delay. So, okay then. Thank you. I'm going to draw this opera novice to a close. Thank you for tuning in wherever and however you're watching this. Our next digital fall event is Opera Up Close Cocktail Hour on Sunday, October 18th, in which we talk to three stage directors who have worked with us, Christine McIntyre, Fenlon Lamb, and Doug Schultz Carlson. Please join us for the conversation and have your questions ready. And then on Saturday, October 24th, we have our second live from the Madison Opera Center performance starring Kyle Kettleson in a tribute to his late voice teacher, Giorgio Tozzi. You will be joined by soprano Emily Secor and piano Scott Gendel. As always, every part of Digital Fall will be online for one month. So if you can't catch it live, computer magic will do its part. And again, I am so grateful that you are spending your time with us. I hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>